Welcome to another edition of Islanders Insider. As we come to you from the locker room here on the campus of Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, today we're talking Islanders basketball with head coaches Willis Wilson of Islander men and Royce Chadwick, head coach of Islander women's basketball. We also have a special feature focusing on Islander volleyball and their trip to the NCAA championships. We'll start things off right now with the head coach of men's hoops, Willis Wilson. Coach, how are you doing? Doing well. How are you? Very, very good. First off, congratulations. Solid week. Solid week for sure. Two victories at the American Bank Center, part of your five-game winning streak that you're currently on. 61-48 uh, win over Austin P. followed by the 47-39 triumph over the Bobcats of Texas State. On the stat sheet, it shows your team is tops in the Southland Conference in both defensive scoring and, well, field goal percentage defense, I think under 36%. Um, we can be flashy on offense at times, but is gritty defense the identity of this team? Offense wins games, defense wins championships. And that's, uh, that's kind of been the history of, of team sports. If you can be good defensively, you've always got a chance to, to win at a high level. We talked about this early on. We go back to the preseason and we're so focused on offense and we really try to sink in the point and drive the point home that there are gonna be nights where the offense isn't there and the defense is gonna have to carry our basketball team. That's been the case here in the early going of the season. We really think that we have the ability to score the ball at a high capacity with in a very efficient manner. But that hasn't been the case so far, and we've really had to lean on our defense. Uh, you talked about Rashawn Thomas just a few moments ago. Uh, was selected for the second week in a row as the Southland Conference Player of the Week, and deservedly so. 13.5 points per game, 15.5 rebounds over this past week, three blocks uh, over those couple games, three averaging three blocks per game. And now he leads the league in rebounds and blocks. I, I mean, you mentioned in the postgame the other night, after his 19 board performance against Texas State, that it was not just tenacity, which he has, but there's also technique that Rashawn has refined to be able to be a stronger rebounder. Yeah, and, and it's it's interesting, you know, rebounding and defense largely is attitude and desire, which which we know Rashawn possesses. But we, we've made some subtle adjustments uh, with him to put him in different positions to be able to rebound the ball more effectively. And it's it's really paid off in these last two games. We, we've really seen a, an increase uh, in his confidence in his defense and his ability to rebound the basketball. Um, some of those things, small technique things that, that really don't merit a lot of conversation, but really have just put him in better position and, and kind of freed him up, I think mentally more than anything, keeping him out of foul trouble, uh, finding ways to keep him more aggressive. So, and something just as subtle as going after the ball with two hands. Well, that, and that's a big thing. I mean, the, the things that I've seen out of Rashawn that show a level of maturity and a, and, a, and a kind of a newness to his game is the fact that he's going on the floor for loose balls, that he's sticking his chest in and killing plays at, on drives, that he's getting out and guarding on the perimeter at point of attack, that he's getting around in the post. Uh, and then the point that you made, uh, you're going to be really good rebounding if you can go after it with two hands. A uh, lesson I learned a number of years ago with an All-American named Adam Keefe, who uh, averaged a double-double, and I think he was one of the top two or three rebounders in the country. He was a guy that just mastered going after that ball with two hands. And uh, uh, when you look at all the great rebounders, they get it in their mitts. They're not going to let anybody else get it from them. No, by no means. Uh, sophomore Joe Kilgore, he's had moments where his youth kind of gets the best of him at times, and he makes a silly mistake. But then he will come back immediately and make an NBA-style play uh, to follow up on the opposite end. Um, some of his blocks ultimately have been springboard moments for your team, especially the back-to-back -back blocks you get against, against well, Austin you know, Peay. We, we laugh around the team, and, and there is a level of seriousness to it, but Joe Kilgore plays. Those are plays that he can make that very few players on the court can make night in and night out at, at any level of, of Division I basketball. And so uh, we're, we're beginning to get accustomed to see him make those plays. One of the things that we've tried to preach to all our guys but especially with the young guys. When you make a, a silly mistake, give us some energy. Make an energy generating play. Go after it. Don't be afraid to, to follow up a bad play with aggression because most of the time the aggressive player and the aggressive team is going to come out on top. One other player I want to talk about that comes off of your bench like Joe Kilgore is redshirt junior Jake Coer. Now, fifth year in the university, third year on the court. He Two separate years he was out due to four hip surgeries. Did you anticipate him to contribute more as a team leader and an inspiration to the guys, or did you have the foresight to see him return as 
really a ball hawk and a playmaker that he really is. You know, all that information you just gave, that's why we have to have programs for players to, <laughs> to kind of keep up with all those things. But uh, on a serious note, Jake has always been a ball hawk. He's been a guy that can come in and, and change the dimension of the game in so many ways. He provides you with consistency. He can steal rebounds. He can guard at point of attack and, and even pick a guy's pocket. And he steals baskets for you. And uh, the one thing that we haven't seen out of him just yet is ability to score the ball from the outside. He, he can put the ball in, in the cup. And uh, he, he's been nothing but an asset. We, we really felt like if Jake could just get back to half of where he was, and I think that's about where he is right now. He, he's only going to get more healthy as the season goes on, get more confident uh, being back on the floor with more experience. But we, we see him as being an integral part to our team. He's a selfless guy. He's, he's here for the team. He kind of understands all of the circ circumstances and, and nuances about our team and about what we're trying to accomplish. So it's, it's really rewarding and, and, and fun to have a guy like that in our program. Oh, there's no doubt. Now we're playing this season uh, 11 games that are going to be featured on television or live streaming on ESPN3. Now this, you know, we're also airing free live streaming, of course, for all games on the Islanders Digital Network, something we're very proud of at GoIslanders.com. But in today's multimedia culture, how important is it to take advantage of these different mediums and expose the program to the masses? Well, it, it's, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, it's, it's a small piece to a bigger puzzle once you start to put those things together where it's really, really large is in recruiting. It gives people around the country and in different markets, and especially the markets where we like to recruit, an opportunity to see us play. And so there's a great deal of familiarity there. Um, but, it, but it also gives people around the country, the basketball pundits, the basketball junkies, and people like that a chance to, to kind of get a gauge for us. You com combine that with a number that doesn't mean a whole lot at this point in the season in RPI, and, and we, we come out of the week with a 35 RPI. That's a little bit unusual, and that obviously is probably going to change for a lot of factors. But it just gives people a chance to look at you, it, and it gives them the opportunity to look at you. They don't have to uh, go to extremes to find who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. Uh, and so it just kind of puts you on the, on the radar. And, th and that's what we want to do. We want to be a mid-major breakthrough to, to be able to do that. We have to have that level of exposure. No doubt. Now moving on to what is next. You travel to San Antonio to face another former Southland competitor in UTSA and then hop on a plane to Madison, Wisconsin to face the Wisconsin Badgers, uh, which, by the way, both will be aired on television, which is always a good thing. Uh, the Roadrunners are, are off to a tough start and appear to be rebuilding uh, this season. The Badgers had to replace a couple key bodies themselves, but of course they were in the NCAA championship game last year. Uh, Tell, tell me a little bit about what you're anticipating for this upcoming week. Well, a, a tough week. A tough week. A tough week. You I know, think it's an understatement. Throw out the record when it comes to UTSA and the Islanders. They've had our number the last three games. There have been some moments where we've been really good, and we go in there to play those guys, and they just hand it to us. And, and that's been the case for whatever reason. Uh, a year ago, they didn't boast a very good record two years ago. And we go in there, and it's just it's just been a struggle. And so we're going to have to play our best best basketball game. There's not a member of our team or our staff that thinks this is going to be a cakewalk. Sure. We've got to go in there and really play the the brand of basketball that we've been playing recently. When you look ahead, and obviously, you know, coaches don't like to look ahead too much. Yeah. But the one thing that stands out to me about Wisconsin was that was the team that knocked Syracuse from the unbeatens when Syracuse was a top ten program. And so there are no. There are no bunnies, uh, Wisconsin, Bo Ryan, those guys do a great job, know Bo very well and known for a long time and the job that he's done throughout his career. He's a Hall of Famer and he's a guy that uh, just really knows how to get his team ready to play. So we're going to have to go in there and play exceptionally well to be able to walk out with a win. Best of luck this week and uh, good luck on the road. Thank you. Coach Willis Wilson joining us here in the locker room once again. When we come back to Islanders Insider, we have a special feature focusing on Islander volleyball and their trip to the NCAA championships. Hey, hey you, couch potato, what are you doing at home? This is where the action is. These seats are great. I can even yell at the coach from here. Hey, coach. Hey, coach. These are great seats. I know, and it's a great game, too. I wish I could sit here. Hey, who's coaching the team? Islanders basketball season tickets are on sale now. Call 825-BALL or visit GoIslanders.com to order yours today. All right, everybody, if this doesn't get your toes tapping, then check your pulse. Ba, 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 ba. 
You know, like every year, you have some ideas of where you're going to be strong and and um, and where you might need to clean some stuff up. And, and until they get in there, you don't really know for sure. Um, honestly, my first impression of early in the season was we got put on our heels a little bit because we had lost uh, one of our setters. And and so um, I was really concerned about protecting Kristen. And um, you know, Ivy hadn't played all spring because of her leg injuries, and so we were you know wanted to make sure we took care of her. Um, and it was mostly just getting through camp healthy and feeling like we were still in one piece. And then by the time we got through camp, we felt pretty good about where we were. Um, and then opening weekend, you know, I just, I know the first two matches weren't that big of a deal, but the Arlington match was a big one and we really wanted to get that win and win a preseason tournament outright, which we had never done before. Um, and so we got a good road win against them and, and all of a sudden it just felt like everything snowballed. Um, we knew Boise was going to be a tough weekend and, and we didn't get wins but we played really well uh, and felt good about our effort and then came back and um, yeah, hosted for the first time and, and started getting our fans involved and letting them see what we were about and then the Rice win and then Central Arkansas and then it was just one thing after another and you could just see the team's confidence just grow day by day almost. and. Uh, you know, every time we would accomplish something new, the expectations would change, the goals would change, and we were always seem to be up for it. So, you know, by the time we got to the playoffs, it was it was just okay. We're finally here. We've been thinking about this for so long and feeling good about what we could do, um, and then it was just kind of finishing it off. So, uh, you know, I was I was, you know, you're always anxious and nervous in the playoffs, but I felt pretty good about what we were going to do, and I never felt like we were going to be in over our head or the moment was going to be too big for us, like maybe in years past when we would get to those big moments. So, um, and along the way you saw these individual players just kind of step up and fill new roles. And, um, and so Matty Dowd may be the most improved player in our conference this year. Morgan Carlson had a huge year and um, by the end of the season was absolutely our number two offensive option. Um, our block got better and better as we went along. And so the things that we had kind of built the team around and anchored ourselves with were still there, but we had added, added other parts. So our team really filled out um, and by the end, I felt like we were, we were right there. So it was a good year. As the years went through, and I like kept going up a year, um, I think the overall talent and the direction, like the leadership, just grew as well. And so I knew it was coming, and I was just hoping before I left that it would come in our year. And it's like Tony was talking about that Rice game, like the snowball effect. Just all the games accumulating after that, and finally at the end of the season, we're sitting there like wow, like we are going to go win a national championship like for our conference. And um, it's just, it's exciting and I'm so happy to be a part of it. Oh yeah, I'll always remember that moment. Um, it was fun, like 
you close your eyes, you're like, am I really here right now? And I like look around, I'm like, yeah, I am. Like the, the gym was packed, we had all of our fans, everyone flew in to come watch us play. Um, I'll definitely really remember that moment. It's hard to find a word that would accurately describe it, but just like all that hard work in the past four years, the, the training, the two-a-days, the early mornings, late night studying, like everything was just kind of all worth it to finally be able to say, like, hey, we made it to the NCAA tournament. We went first round, went out with A&M, went out with the bang, and um, just the great season to look back on. Um, it was just a rewarding experience and just, just sad almost in a way just to realize that my career here is done even though I've um, come a long way with surgeries and players leaving in my grade and people coming in and transfers like that. But just looking back at it now, it's just awesome, awesome feeling. I think we realized that, wow, we can play, like, let's keep going, let's, let's, although the match didn't go our way, but I think I took all the nerves out after the first point, everyone kind of was like, hey, I can breathe, this is just another game. for the Houston Astros. Texas A&M University of Corpus Christi has absolutely helped get me to where I am today. And it is a small campus with large opportunities. You should definitely choose Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. 97% of A&M Corpus Christi graduates will be working or in graduate school upon graduation. Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Discover your island. Visit us today at tour.tamucc.edu. My family has been growing crops here since the late 1800s. We're Texas farmers through and through, and that's why we love HEB. They've been supporting local farms like ours for generations. And they buy more of our corn than anyone else in Texas. Over 10 million pounds annually, and they use it to make great products like HEB corn chips. So when you try them, you're eating a little piece of Texas. We're the Sawed Off family, and this is the locally grown department at HEB. No store does more than my HEB. Welcome back to Islanders Insider. At this time, we're going to talk some women's hoops with the head coach of the program, Coach Royce Chadwick. Coach, how are you doing? I'm good, Stephen. How are you? Uh, really good. Since the last time we met, picked up a couple wins. Very nice. 57-42 win over Western New Mexico and an impressive 49-46 win over UTRGV. The Vaqueros down from UT Rio Grande Valley. Now, there are some individual performances that we can point out, but the one common, no common denominator for these two wins was team defense holding the opponents under 30% shooting on the night in both of those games. What has been the secret to that type of success? Well, I think uh, we're doing it as a team. I think we are uh, have a lot of undersized people playing post, and they've done a really good job of 
trying to use their quickness as opposed to trying to use brute strength. I think our guards have done a really good job in transition. Uh, early in the year, we were really struggling in transition defense. I think we've semi sort of got that ironed out. We're communicating well. We're trying to hold people to one and done. And we're just playing team schemes like a veteran team should. And, uh, you know, Real Grand Valley, I think, was averaging like 74 when they came in and, and we held them to 40 something. And they were a uh, prolific three point shooting team, shooting about 40%. And uh, I think they were over, you know, until right there at the very end. So I uh, feel pretty good about our, our defense. Got a, a long way to go, but we're playing uh, well for uh, early December right now. You know, that Vaquero team, when I saw them earlier, I thought they were pretty special because, you know, I think it's the best team they've probably had in a few years, to be truthful. We watched them in your tournament earlier in the season um, in a rivalry game, and that's what it is, such as that one. Anything can happen and usually does because they look so good in that tournament, but on this night, it was Islanders. Well, I don't think we could have beaten them in our tournament. I think that uh, the way we were playing um, November 15th and the way they were playing November 15th, we would have uh, not been able to, to do what we were able to do December. So we got better in a couple of weeks. I think that they improved, but I think we improved dramatically on the defensive end and uh, we were able to get the W. But I will tell you, Stephen, the fans made all the difference in the world. You know, you come to uh, our games, come to the men's game, what's the band? You know, our band is as good as any band in the country. They, they are extremely well led. They are into the game. They are making noise and they are a, a detriment for the opponent. And our fans made a huge difference in, in the, that game for us as well. Uh, there is no doubt they're doing a fantastic job uh, talking about the defense of the Islanders. As a matter of fact, your team leads the Southern Conference in field goal percentage defense at 37.1%, uh, three point defense 29.9%, and scoring defense holding teams to just over 57 points per game. You know, has the team exceeded your expectations with their defensive effort and results to this point? Well, we always hoped that we would be there. You know, we led the league in defense last year, so that was kind of a, a holdover. We have the exact same team except Olivia Fowdy, and Olivia's end of the floor that she liked the most was not the defensive end. <laughs> so we felt like we have the potential to do that. We've had some injuries that we've had to overcome. We lost our shot blocker and Ashante Plummer, so now we have to take charges as opposed to stepping up and blocking shots. We lost our enforcer in the paint and Janessica Lawler. Um, we lost our presence in the paint and Jayton Walls. So we're having to play a different type of defense than we played last year. A lot less smash mouth and a lot more uh, try to anticipate and move and get your body in position. So our players have adjusted very well and hopefully we can build upon that and get better as the season goes along. Defensively, the numbers are very good, but also your tops in the league with 41 rebounds per game and a, six, a positive 6.4 rebound margin. With your injuries at the center position, which you just talked about, this had to be a surprise. Well, without a doubt, but uh, rebounding is a 98% desire and technique of I'm going to make sure my, my girl does not get the rebound and hopefully somebody with the same color jersey as me gets it and if not, I'll be the one to run it down. So, you know, we've, we've done a really good job of blocking out, holding our people out and, and hustling the, to get that rebound, but boy, rebounding has a lot to do with your desire to get it and, and we've been able to, to do that, but it's, it's about to get tough for us. I mean, it's a, a whole different enchilada coming up in the next couple of weeks. Oh, there is no doubt. We're going to get into that in just a moment here. Let me ask you this about the, the capabilities of the team, what they're doing defensively, what they're doing on the boards. If, if you had to make a choice, would you prefer your team to be that hard-nosed, overly physical team or more the talented, athletic finesse squad? Well, you, you get that talented, athletic finesse squad in recruiting and you go out and you get a couple of players that are top 20 in the uh, state of Texas and they come in and then you start finessing and jumping over people. Um, sometimes that's hard to do in the Southland Conference. So you, you can be a tough team. You, you can teach anybody to play defense and then it comes down to how tough you are internally and the drive that you have, the character, the, the respect that you earn on the court. So our players have done it with toughness and, and that's a great thing to have because your offense doesn't show up some nights. And, and we've not been, been a prolific offensive team. And on nights when our offense doesn't show like it didn't against uh, Rio Grande Valley in the second half, I think we had five or six field goals the entire second half. We have to do it with our defense and, and that's what we're doing right now. 
Uh, junior Kamisha Davis, talk about offense and what we are needing. We're needing offense from her. She did have her best offensive game of the season, though, against UTRGV. The craziest thing is it took until the fifth game of the season for her to shoot, for her, to shoot her first free throw of the year. Uh, was she being overlooked by officials or plain and simple just not doing enough to get to the foul line? I think she was deferring to everyone else. She is a, a non-assuming young lady. Uh, she felt like Shea was our returning leading scorer. She was going to make something happen. Uh, we have uh, all these post players down low. Kamisha was trying to get them the ball down low. Uh, she was waiting for Brittany to get all the points. And, you know, Brittany would come out in the first quarter of every game and light everybody up. Then the defense would adjust, and it was like, okay, who can step up now? Uh, so, Kamisha, we talked to her, she challenged herself. I think she's starting to become the kind of player that we always thought she could be. She is a high flyer. She can jump over you. She can finesse you. She can do some things with her athleticism. And I, I think it's a deal of, you know, they say if you're drowning, you want one person on the pier so that they'll say, oh gosh, I gotta make something happen. If you're drowning and there are eight people on the pier, they go and the water's cold, you go. No, you go, you go. And so while they're debating it, uh, you drown. Well, now we're in a situation where Kamisha's looking around saying, we gotta score, it's me or we're not gonna score. And I think that's why she's become more aggressive. Coach, best of luck this week. Thank you very much. When we come back, we'll tell you what's up next for Islanders Athletics. You're watching Islanders Insider. Islander women's basketball will be taking the court at the Dugan Wellness Center on Friday the 11th at 7 o'clock as they take on Angelo State. On Monday the 14th, Islander women's basketball will host UNLV at the Dugan Wellness Center. That start time, 7 o'clock. Islander men's basketball will head out on the road Saturday the 12th as they travel to San Antonio to take on UTSA. That start time, 2 o'clock. And on Tuesday the 15th, Islander men's basketball will go north to Madison, Wisconsin, take on the Wisconsin Badgers. That's an 8 o'clock start time and a game that can be seen on the Big Ten Network. Once again, we want to thank Willis Wilson, head coach of Islander men's basketball, for joining us here in the locker room, as well as Coach Royce Chadwick of Islander women's basketball. And most importantly, as always, we thank you for tuning in. I'm Stephen King from everyone here at the Islander broadcast crew. You've been watching Islander Insider.